Welcome to Grace Abounds. I'm Pastor Jen Shaw, and in this podcast, I'm sharing my Sunday sermons from St. John's Lutheran Church, Palm Desert, California. I'm so grateful that you've joined us, and I trust that these words build you up in faith, hope, and love. Five years before I headed off to Fuller Seminary, I was a member of a small group at Ascension Lutheran Church in Thousand Oaks. And we met every Tuesday night in the church library for an hour and a half of sacred fellowship. We shared our joys and our sorrows and prayed together. We studied the scriptures and shared our perspectives. We celebrated birthdays and anniversaries and promotions. One particular Tuesday night, Shortly after I had been laid off from my job as the communications manager at Universal Studios Hollywood, we were studying the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And as we talked about all that Joseph went through, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, thrown into prison on false accusations, and how Joseph remained faithful to the Lord who was with him through it all, I realized that Joseph was not defined by his circumstances, but by his relationship with the Lord. And I realized this is true for me as well. I am not defined by my circumstances, but by my relationship with the Lord who made me and has saved me and loves me forever. I realized this in a group of friends People who had consistently and generously expressed God's love, offered me words of comfort and encouragement, spoke with me about God's grace and God's timing. I grew as a disciple of Jesus in the beloved company of these disciples of Jesus. As all four Gospels recount, one of the very first things that Jesus does after he has been baptized in the Jordan River and overcome temptation in the wilderness, is call disciples to follow him. Gather trainees to learn from him how to be like him. Form a beloved community of disciples to share his good news and carry on his good work. John 1 recounts the call of the disciples Philip and Nathaniel. Now this happens the day after John the Baptist who baptized Jesus, told Andrew that Jesus is the Savior, and then Andrew became a disciple of Jesus. And then Andrew went and found his brother Peter and said to Peter, we have found the Messiah, and brought Peter to Jesus, and Peter became a disciple. The next day, Jesus went to Galilee, and he found Philip, who was from the city of Bethsaida, the city of Peter and Andrew. And Jesus said to Philip, follow me. And Philip became a disciple. And then Philip went and found his friend Nathanael and said to him, essentially, we have found the Messiah, the Savior, the one written about by Moses and the prophets, and he is Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, there may be a few things behind this snarky question, perhaps some small town rivalry between Nazareth and Bethsaida. Or perhaps he is just expressing the general opinion that surely the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior would obviously come from the metropolis of Jerusalem, the center of Jewish life and faith, and not from an unremarkable village in Galilee. But Philip just says, come and see, and then he brings Nathanael to Jesus, and Nathanael becomes a disciple. Now, Philip, in his conversation with Nathanael, sets the example for us of evangelism. Philip doesn't dispute Nathanael, doesn't pull out the Bible and point to all the verses that prove him wrong, shame him for his spiritual ignorance. A friend and fellow pastor once said, you can't argue people into church. Philip also doesn't respond with angry words to Nathaniel's dismissive remark 
or walk away in frustration or give up after this apparent rejection. Philip simply says, come and see. Philip invites Nathanael to experience Jesus in the beloved community Jesus is forming. Nathanael accepts the invitation, and then Jesus astounds him by telling Nathanael that he knows he is an Israelite who tells it like it is, and that he saw him under the fig tree before Philip called him. Nathanael immediately says, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel. And Jesus says, you haven't seen anything yet. You will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending upon the Son of Man, a title Jesus frequently used for himself. Now here Jesus is referring to the experience of Jacob, who 2,000 years before had been traveling outside of Jerusalem, stopped for the night, and dreamt of a ladder, Jacob's ladder on which the angels of God were ascending and descending, the heaven was open, and the Lord stood by Jacob and promised that he would be with him wherever he went. When Jacob woke up, he named the place Bethel, Bethel, house of God, because the Lord was there. In this reference, Jesus is indicating that he is The ladder, the connection between heaven and earth, the one who opens heaven for us, the embodiment of the God who is with us and for us always. He is the Lord, our creator, redeemer, sustainer. And in calling disciples who go out and call disciples, Jesus does what the Lord does throughout Scripture. The Lord called Jacob, whom he renamed Israel, to be father of a family through whom all the families of the earth will be blessed, a family into whom the Messiah, Jesus, was born. The Lord called Samuel, as 1 Samuel 3 recounts, when Samuel was a boy serving the Lord, assisting the priest Eli. Now it is Eli who realizes that it is the Lord calling Samuel's name in the middle of the night and instructs him to say, speak, for your servant is listening. Now, God could have told Samuel directly who he was, but he didn't. He gave that insight to Eli, and Eli instructed Samuel. The Lord called Samuel as a prophet, and Eli participated in that call. The Lord called David, A thousand years before Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem, David's hometown, to be the leader of the people of Israel. And it was Samuel the prophet, later in life, who found and anointed David as king. Samuel participated in David's call. As David writes in Psalm 139, God searches us out and knows us. There is no place we can go that the Lord isn't with us. We are wonderfully, marvelously made to participate together in the life God gives and is. God in God's very being is relational. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who are a divine, eternal, beloved community. And God works in and through relationships. God came to us in Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again, to reconcile us in relationship with the Lord and each other, to heal us in the whole creation, to restore us in beloved community. And Jesus demonstrates this. Jesus could have engaged in his public ministry all on his own. He certainly had the power to do so, but he didn't. And if even Jesus didn't go it alone, I wonder what makes us think we can. Jesus formed a beloved community of disciples, and he invited his disciples to participate in his ministry during his time on earth. And he entrusted his disciples with his ministry just before he ascended into heaven. 
Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Peace I give to you as the Father sent me, so I send you. The Apostle Paul, in his life and in his letters, articulates this great commission of Jesus, helps his listeners understand what it means to be the beloved community of Christ, encourages the church and all its members to live a life worthy of our call. And this includes, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, honoring God in our body. Now, Paul writes this letter to Christians who were in the city of Corinth, essentially the uh, Vegas of its time. What happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. It was a Roman colony. It was the capital of what we today know as Greece. And it was well known for its worship of the Greek goddess Aphrodite who is the goddess of love and beauty and procreation. I won't go into details, but uh, part of the worship of Aphrodite included temple prostitution, which was a somewhat acceptable practice in that society because of the cultural understanding that the body was just really a container for the spirit. The spirit was really who you were. And so what you did with your body didn't really matter. It was what you did with your spirit that counted. And so theoretically, you could mistreat your own body or the bodies of others and still be pure in spirit. Paul, rightly, will have none of it. The Lord made our whole being, including our body. Our whole being is redeemed. Our whole being is united with Christ. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that the Lord has given to you. And so what you do with your body and with the bodies of others matters. Jesus came in the flesh after all. And in his ministry, he healed people, body and soul. He cared for people's spiritual and physical needs. And he called disciples and calls disciples to follow him and do the same. In the words of St. Teresa of Avila, Christ has no body on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. During my time at Ascension Lutheran Church, I read a book and taught on a book that I've shared had a great impact on me, Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy. And in that book, Willard describes discipleship as being with Jesus, spending intentional time with Jesus, learning from Jesus, how to live my life, my whole life, my real life. And Willard continues that if you seek to be a disciple, ask, tell the Lord that you want to follow him and then dwell, pray every day and study the scripture and come to worship and be in the beloved community of Jesus and learn and grow and then intend Commit, follow Jesus. May we learn from Jesus how to live our whole life. May we follow Jesus where he leads. And may we go out and make disciples of Jesus with the gracious invitation. Come and see. Amen. Thanks for listening. Each week's episode is edited by Nick Cox. Music performed by our St. John's Worship Band. Sermons by me, Pastor Jen Shaw. Make sure to subscribe to hear each week's message. 
If you'd like to know more about St. John's mission to know Christ and make Christ known, to share the life-giving word and do the life-giving work of Jesus, visit our website, stjohnslutheran.church. May God bless you on this day and in all the days ahead.